Silver carp. Uh, a lot of you probably heard about these guys uh, on the news. Uh, silver carp, also called Asian carp, which is kind of a silly term because there's lots of different species of carp that come from Asia, uh, uh, th three or four of which are actually uh, invasive in North America now. So the silver carp, uh, I mean, these, each of these fish in that live well there are about this, about this big. And this is the species of fish that you may have seen video on the internet or on the news actually jumping out of the water into the boat. We got, I got this many fish. I mean, this is a lot of weight of fish that literally jumped into the boat on their own, just there you go. I didn't have to do anything. We filled that whole live well up in about 30 minutes. I was on a boat. We were, at first, we were electrofishing with the um, Missouri Department of Conservation just to kind of get a survey of what was in the water. And then we turned the electrofishing tackle off, off, and we were still catching plenty of these things. What happens is this is probably another example of the founder's effect. Uh, the fish seem to react to probably the sound. It might be electromagnetic. We don't know what, this, what it is, but it's, it seems to be at the approach of uh, uh, a boat's motor they jump out of the air, out of the water, and leap through the air. And this is a fish that can weigh up to 40 or even 50 pounds, so it's like <laughs> duck. You know, somebody, nobody has been killed yet, but it's going to happen. People have wound up in the ER with, with broken jaws. And there, there aren't that many things in life where you hear about them and think, what's this like? And you go check it out, where it actually turns out to be everything you had, you know, <laughs> expected. And, and this, this was it. Um, it's, it's just in, incredible what's happened to these waterways. Uh, the silver carp now in some tributaries of the uh, Missouri and Mississippi rivers uh, constitute about 90 percent of the biomass. I mean, it is, it, is, it is absolutely unbelievable how these things have taken over. Uh, there's supposed to be a video here showing them, but it's, this computer is not playing it. So you just have to imagine me ducking when silver carp are la launching. Literally, it's like a missile just right at your head. It's incredible. Uh, this is how they have been so dominant. Um, uh, as I mentioned, the, um, the, the, they do jump out of the water. They don't do that uh, at the sound of an approaching boat in, in Asia. They don't, in China, they don't do that. It, so the, it's probably just that you had maybe a couple of these oddball fish in the population that was brought in uh, initially when they were trying to breed them. And, um, and so you can just have a few of these strange fish that had this this strange habit, which would probably have sorted them out of the gene pool pretty quickly in their native habitat, but they, uh, they have really nothing stopping them uh, in, in, in the U.S. They, they have so many other advantages in this ecosystem that having that bad habit of jumping out of the water like that hasn't held them back. So this is what the gills of a, uh, a silver carp looks like. This sort of sponge-like pad here is not something that every fish has. Th think of this like baleen on a whale. They're filter feeders. Silver carp feed mostly on uh, phytoplankton and zooplankton. And they do, all they have to do is sit there and face into the current and breathe. Every time this fish breathes, it eats. Again, sort of like a baleen whale, just straining food out of the water. So they don't have to take risks. Those fry have very low uh, rates of predation uh, from, from larger fish because they don't have to come out of uh, cover to feed. And so they sit there just getting bigger, and they're feeding at the bottom of the food chain. And so e but even when they're you know, two feet long, they're still feeding at the bottom of the food chain. And what that does is short circuits everything else that would normally be used in that zooplankton and phytoplankton. So all the fry from other fish, it just slows down recruitment in that sense. And they don't have to take risks to get, that, get, to get big, because again, they can just stay in thick cover. They can stay under a log or in some thick weeds or something like that and not have to risk anything. And then once they get to be you know, 12 inches or so, long, nothing is really going to touch them. Every now and then a bald eagle will come in and eat them, or an osprey will get one off the surface when it's small. But they don't have to take risks. They just sit there, and they grow, and they grow, and they grow. And they can suck up you know, as much as 90% of the biomass. When we went out electrofishing, I could see you know, everything going down like five or six feet in the water would float up kind of dizzy. And, then, and it's fine. It swims away after all. It, doesn't, it just sort of stuns the fish. But there were a lot of little shad. I saw one gar. I saw one uh, it was a fish called a buffalo a few largemouth bass, and then it was just silver carp. And this was in like you know two hours or so of riding around. It was incredible how they have destroyed this ecosystem. But here's what I don't get. You know, why all this hand wringing? What are we going to do about this fish that jumps into the boat on its own? You know, it's not, and, and the, you hear fishermen talk about carp. They say, oh, you can't eat carp. It's, it tastes like cardboard. It's terrible. And you ask them, have you ever eaten a carp? No, I wouldn't eat that. It tastes fine. This stuff, is, this stuff is delicious. I did blind taste test with this, cooking it for people, and they thought it was cod. You know, just like, like with the tilapia and the, and the Chilean sea bass, Americans have no idea. We can't tell one fish from another, especially once it's fried. Uh, so I, I, I don't understand. 
you know, wait, black. I thought I had the <laughs> picture there. I, just, I don't understand why we've got this project now. They're talking about spending up to I think 17 or 18 billion dollars to keep silver carp out of the Great Lakes. They've got electro barriers and all the, and they're going to have a series of locks and all this stuff, and and they're doing working on like chemical attractants and all this sort of thing. And look, what all you need to get rid of this fish is you don't need billions of dollars. It's Stone Age technology. It's two people with a net and a boat could probably bring four or five tons in a day, and it tastes fine. Again, you would eat this and you would have no idea that it was carb. You think it would, that it was cod. Uh, but the problem is that cod that. Um, Unlike cod or a lot of other fish, uh, the uh, carp have these sort of floating bones. Their bone structure is a little bit different, and so you can't process them on the same equipment that would that you would use, you know, in a, on a like a factory type line for processing, um, you know, cod or something like that. So the equ existing equipment doesn't work. But there's actually there's a, a chef that I worked, I spent time with in Baton Rouge named Philippe Parola. He's done work with both Nutria and with uh, with silver carp. He's a French trained chef. Uh, used to be in the French Foreign Legion. Really interesting guy. And he actually got FDA and USDA approval to market he to, to market carp as a silver fin. Again, Chilean sea bass used to be called Patagonian toothfish. I mean, it's just in, in how you sell this stuff. Um, but the problem, and he's come up with equipment to actually steam the meat off instead of just slicing it off, where you get like 99% efficiency. The problem is that you know these these fishermen on the Missouri River, you know, they're only getting like 10 cents a pound right now because it's all most of it's going to fertilizer. And actually, there are some plants that take the heads from really just the right silver carp, and uh, those are getting sent to China and Korea where they're they're being made made into soup. And that's nice. But that's only like a niche thing, especially when you're flying it out there it's never going to add up to all that much so these fishermen they're making less than minimum wage because again it's this stuff is going into fertilizer 10 cents a pound is just not enough to live off of well you know you've got you compare this to cod or a lot of other white fish that we that, that we eat all the time that's you know getting anywhere from three to four dollars dockside uh, and these are fish that we're running out of well you know if you could pay these fishermen 50 cents a pound They'd be doing great. Now, then you'd have people say, "I'm going to go out and do this." You'd have more than a handful of them. You know, like I, so I can I can pay myself a living wage and pay for my gas and put some money away for my kids to go to college. Yeah, then they're going to do it. Um, but to get that price per pound, you know, what they need is a factory. They need a plant close by that they can take their catch to and sell it and have it and have that price where it's going into the food system instead of into uh, into fertilizer. And it would make a huge difference. Uh, so we could build a plant like that. You could put something like that in the farm bill for five or six million dollars. Build the plant. Let the free market take care of this. You know, you put this stuff in fish sticks. People, you you go buy fish sticks at the grocery store. It just says fish sticks. What, what species is it? I don't know. You know, they, you have to look at the back of the box. Most people have no idea. But so instead of spending five or six million dollars on a processing plant, we're going to spend billions of dollars on these pie in the sky barriers to keep them out of the Great Lakes, which will not work, by the way, because you can build all these barriers. Sooner or later, someone's going to take a bait bucket and not realize they've got little silver carp in it instead of minnows. Or they're going to have a live well on a bass boat, and they're going to go from the Illinois River into one of the Great Lakes. It's just a few miles you know, from point A to point B. Someone's going to do that. And all this money they're talking about spending on this program, it's, uh, it will be circumvented. This, I think, is the, probably the best chance for, it won't be complete eradication, but we can control them. You know, we can eat our way out of that problem. Giant Canada geese. You guys have all seen these guys. Uh, Canada geese, in general, are native to North America, but the giant Canada goose, which is most of what we have around in Albemarle County, you know, we're not on uh, a traditional uh, flyway here this this far inland. The giant Canada goose is sort of an interesting story. It's a conservation st uh, uh, story gone horribly right or wrong. Uh, it was actually at one time it was thought to be the su this subspecies was thought to be completely extinct. And they found a small population living on a lake in Minnesota in the 1950s. And so there was an effort to, to bring this species back and to breed them up in captivity. And they did. And this worked very well. And then in the 1960s, you had a lot of um, the waterfowl situation was different because there had been so much market hunting in eastern states. We'd lost a whole lot of waterfowl, two things that had been overhunted uh, to be sold for food. And uh, a whole lot of um, wildlife management people, biologists, uh, and state agencies said, you know, we'd kind of like to get some, some geese in here again. We'd like to have some more waterfowl. And um, the candidate, best candidate for introduction was that they thought, well, the giant Canada goose subspecies, in part because they thought, well, let's ensure that it, that it really survives. Well, part of the problem was that these geese had been in captivity for a few generations. And you know, geese learn how to. Um, they they learn where to um, uh, uh, 
where, where to migrate to from other geese. When they've been in, in, uh, in uh, uh, captivity for a, f for a few generations, they, have no, they still have that instinct to get up and go somewhere. So next time you see, uh, in Albemarle County anyway, you see some geese flying south for the winter, okay, look at a compass, because they're probably usually just going around in circles. So what we have in, um, in this, in, in this uh, area is what, what are called resident populations of geese. And they are arguably invasive here. Again, North America is a big place, so there are places where they are native to. But they have an outsized ecological impact. Um, fortunately, they are delicious. These are some geese that um, had parked themselves at a Glasshouse Winery and had just been eating uh, the grapes. That's just right out in Albemarle County. And the, the geese have a bigger impact than they should in nature because normally, OK, you have a pond. You've got a, maybe one or two pairs of geese that will nest there. And then their young uh, get old enough, and they pick up, and they fly south. And they're gone. And the pond has a chance to rest. You know, these geese, are, they're crapping in it all the time, which you know, it's one thing for, for a, a body of water to deal with that, that load of, of nitrogen and everything else coming in uh, for a few months. But they, when they're parked there year round, well, that's got a little bit of a different impact. And then there's so few natural predators. Actually, one, one of the, we think one of the big predators on Canada geese, you know, 200 years ago was actually bald eagles. Uh, well, bald eagles have recovered, but we're, they're sort of, they're still probably only like 5% uh, population density now of what we had, you know, a couple hundred years ago. But there's not a whole lot of natural predation on them. So you can have a pond with some grass around it. And instead of having you know, um, half a dozen geese that are there for you know, four or five months out of the year, it grows to where you've got 50, 60 geese that are parked there year round. And it does have an ecological impact. Um, fortunately, um, yeah, ge goose meat is delicious. As you can see, it's a red meat. People think, oh, it's a bird. It's poultry. It's going to taste like chicken. Couldn't be farther from the truth. Uh, goose meat tastes like, um, it's, it's more like beef than anything else, I would say, but with a very soft fat that is, of course, so prized in, uh, in French cuisine, while geese tend to have less fat. But uh, it's, it's delicious, and you don't have to do this Charles Dickens thing where you cook it in the oven like all day long and, and serve it whole. You can do easy goose. In fact, in this case, we, um, we turned these into burgers. We just ran them through a, a meat grinder, and it was wonderful. Yeah, so, so these geese, they're not protected from hunting, right? No, no. I mean, they're, they're regulated. All, migra all waterfowl, whether or not they actually migrate, if they ever did migrate, are, are covered by the Federal Migratory Waterfowl Act. But that doesn't mean protected, necessarily. So all migratory birds, are, um, their hunting is regulated by the federal government. And the federal government says, please hunt them. Uh, so there's a September season with very high bag limits. I think you get something like six or eight a day of resident populations. That's, now, it's a little bit different uh, birds that are on a traditional flyway, where they actually are migrating. Um, they've got lower bag limits and, and a shorter season. So there are laws regulating the hunting, and those laws provide for very liberal bag limits. And there's you know, restricted seasons and all that. But generally speaking, the policy is get them out of here. <laughs>